Slavery is one of those words that brings a lot of different images to the imagination. So it's a very powerful idea too, especially in America where we have a history of racist slavery. So we want to look at slavery in the Old Testament. And one of the important things that's going to be uh, crucial for us to do is to be sure to understand it in its proper light. Because we have one word, slavery, that can mean a lot of different things. Now, the first thing that we need to look at is what are the historical causes of slavery? Where did slaves come? There are a bunch of different answers to this question, and I think they're kind of revealing in terms of giving us an understanding of historical slavery throughout the world, not just in the United States. So first of all, kind of obviously, children born to slaves were a common source of slaves. That's often why uh, female slaves were valued more than fem uh, male slaves, which is why when Pharaoh is looking to get rid of Moses, this deliverer who's just been born, he says, all right, kill all the boys, but keep the girls, because they're valuable. Why? Because they make more slaves. All right, so it's children were the first one. Now, a second one, which we don't often think of, is that they're prisoners of war. And standard practice in the ancient world was that when you, when you fought a war against someone or someone attacked you, the winner would take the prisoners of war and they would offer them a choice. You can either be put to death right now, or you can become our slaves. And in terms of, uh, you know, what about other options? Well, sending them back home, well, they might just, you know, get another sword and come back and try again. So that was seen as a bad option. Not that it never happened, but it was seen as a bad option. Some options that weren't on the table were the idea of, let's say, sending them to prison. Because in the ancient world, there are no prisons. There is no place where you send people where they have a bed and three square meals a day and don't really have to do anything. Because if they had those in the ancient world, everybody would have been committing crimes to go to prison because most people had to work all day just to be able to feed themselves. So when you have that kind of an economy, the idea that you're going to put people in prison is just simply not an option. And so you resort to others. You take the risk of sending them back and they can attack again, or you make them slaves. You make them productive workers in your fields or your industries, or you kill them. So that's why the options in the ancient world were what they are. We have we might consider more options today because, well, frankly, we can afford it. Uh, it would be much more difficult back then. It would be almost impossible. Now, a third option here is people selling themselves into slavery, which is something we, is not really a part of American slavery at all, but is pretty common in the history of the world, and it's referenced in the Old Testament, and it happens in Roman sources uh, we know uh, as well. So why on earth would somebody sell themselves into slavery? Well, the first reason might be that they're at the point of starvation. And so they sell themselves as a slave because when you sell yourself as a slave, you become part of a household. And when you're part of a household, you get a daily portion of food. Now you have to work all the time. Your life is no longer your own, but at least you're not starving to death. And that's why for people in really desperate situations, that was an option. It might be the case that, sort of along with that, that selling yourself into slavery was the only way to pay your debts. And it was with your labor because... You know, in, in economies with low capital, the very poor people, they didn't have capital. They didn't have land that they could use. They didn't have large herds that they could sell. They didn't even have a lot of tools, probably. All they had was their labor. And so that's what they would use to pay their debts uh, by selling themselves into slavery. Again, not common in America, but historically it happened. Fourth, kidnapping. Now, this is one of the big sources for American slaves. Uh, a lot of kidnapping that happened in Africa, uh, and those slaves were uh, then sold to European slave traders who then sent them to the New World. A fifth source of slavery was abandoned children. So it was actually common in the ancient world, especially the ancient Roman world, that if a child was born into the family and for some reason the family didn't want it, either they had enough kids already or they couldn't afford another one or there was something wrong with it, you know, the kid had a a cleft palate or, you know, was cross-eyed or whatever, the father of the family could choose to give away the kid. And this was very common. And actually, uh, oftentimes people would take the child to the edge of town. They would take it to the dung hill and they'd leave it on the dung hill, which is where the poop, you know, the town poop was left to decompose. And they'd leave their kids there. And if nobody picked up the kid, the kid would die of exposure to the elements. If somebody came by and saw the baby, they could uh, adopt it and make it their own. And then when it became older, they could sell it uh, into slavery. They could use it as a household slave or as a prostitute. And that also was fairly common. And finally, 
uh, slavery could be a punishment for a crime. Uh, now, it's very interesting that in the United States Constitution, according to the 13th Amendment, slavery is outlawed in the United States except as punishment for a crime. Like, this is still legal. And when you think about it, what happens if you go to prison and you have to work on, you know, a chain gang or something like that, you have to do some kind of work detail, uh, produce a product for the prison, whatever, what, what's happening? Well, you're not in control of your life. You're told when you're going to eat and when you're going to sleep and when you're going to do all these things. Uh, you're not allowed to have a normal family life. Uh, you don't decide when you're going to come and when you're going to go. And you don't get to make any money off your labor or very, very little. Maybe you make like 20 cents an hour or something like that. And so somebody, if, if you dap somebody from the ancient world and brought them to U.S. prison and saw prisoners working on something, they'd say, oh, this is slavery which is why the U.S. Constitution specifically allows slavery as punishment for crime, because going to prison could be seen as a form of slavery. But again, remember, historically, prisons don't exist. They don't have money for that. And they don't want to encourage people to commit crimes by promising them to send them to a place where they'll get three square meals a day. So prisons are not an option uh, in the ancient world like they are in the, in the modern world. Now I want to say just a little bit more about the differences between Jewish slavery and slavery in the American system or in the Roman system. Because again, we're using one word, it can mean various things. In the American South before the Civil War, slavery included a lot of things. Kidnapping in Africa, loading slaves into slave ships and sending them to the New World, and forcing them to work on plantations in the New World. So you've got rape, you've got whippings, you've got families broken up. It was a terrible situation. And rape was very common. The U.S. Constitution said that an escaped slave had to be returned to his, uh, who his master. Now, the Romans were, had a similar form of slavery, except it wasn't racist. They'll enslave anybody. And the Romans also tended to have more educated slaves. It wouldn't be unusual to have uh, educated uh, slaves in the household. Also, the Romans were sexually more interested in their male slaves as well as their female slaves. So that was another difference, too. Now, in America, you weren't allowed for much of our history to free slaves or to teach them how to read. In Roman slavery, uh, you had, here were all the restrictions the Romans had on what you could do with their slaves. Which means you could pretty much do anything. But the Old Testament had a lot of restrictions on slavery. It was kind of uh, interesting compared to the world around them. So the Israelites had to free their slaves every seven years. Freed slaves uh, had to be given possessions. Their owners weren't allowed to uh, pout. They, uh, fugitives couldn't, could not be oppressed, which is interesting. And so you can see the other restrictions here too. They, you know, they couldn't just beat them or kill them, uh, th that they could be punished for doing so. And I think most importantly, the slaves had to be freed, uh, to, from work on the Sabbath so that they too could worship God. And so it's, it, what I think is really, um, crucial here is that the Israelite view of slaves is not just that they're a bunch of animals that you can make use of that they were people and that they had, you had certain rights and obligations to them, um, especially if they were a fellow, uh, a fellow Israelite. So that just gives you an idea of how we can take one word, slavery, and it can mean something in Rome that, and it means something very different in America. Again, Roman slavery, not racist. American slavery, totally racist. You know, you didn't find any white slaves ever. Romans, psh, I don't care what color, color you are. It's the, you know, the slave field was the rainbow coalition. Uh, but in Jewish slavery, uh, you had something very different. It was very different all, uh, I think basically all together, and more like what we would call historically in this country as indentured servitude, where someone would agree to work for a time uh, for someone else, and then at the end of that time, they would be freed from their service. You know? And that was very common for poor people who wanted to get to America. They would agree to be indentured servants for a time so that they could have uh, their passage uh, on the ship paid, which was very expensive. So just a couple of final concluding points um, that the, in terms of the slave code in the Old Testament, that it was meant to inculcate respect for this class of persons that existed in the ancient world, slaves, that typically did not have any rights. And so what the, what the Jewish uh, law is trying to do is trying to make people remember that these are people as well and that they do have rights and that there are real limits um, very severe limits compared to Rome, which had no limits, um, on what you could do with them. 
And, it, you know, it's hard for us to understand this reality looking at the American system where you had people who were, who were kidnapped from their home and brought in. And it wasn't an organic thing. It was like this was an industry uh, from beginning to end. But in the ancient world, again, some people are selling themselves into slavery in order to avoid starvation. It was just one of those options that was seen as available as part of uh, the economic reality. Or if you're fighting a war, you know, you have prisoners left over, you got to do something with them, you know. So this is, the ancient world's understanding of slavery was very different. And the Jewish understanding of how you treat slaves is very different than the rest of the ancient world. Again, the Jews are very weird, historically. You know, just one God, circumcision, you know, having rules about how you treat your slaves. They, they did a lot of really weird things. You know, no images of your God. What's up with that? So they're very weird. It's also important to remember that the Old Testament is not the last word on slavery, that the New Testament is going to say something even more and go even beyond it. But that is for the New Testament.